Welcome back, Drive Time. Uh, this week is week two uh, with Steve Sonderman. Steve is the uh, founder of the No Regrets Conference. It's a men's conference that operates at an international level. Steve's been involved in men's ministry for uh, over 28 years. Uh, he was a pastor for uh, uh, Elmbrook Church in Wisconsin. And if you missed it last week, uh, Steve just gave a an amazing, uh, dare I say, rant uh, about why <laughs> guys need men's ministry. Uh, and, and it was, uh, unlike a lot of rants, it was encouraging and, and uh, life-giving, but really, uh, I feel, challenged us to, to engage uh, at the group level, uh, based on his, you know, over three decades in, in ministry. Um, but we're going to continue that conversation today because out of our conversations between us, um, really saw the need to address the idea of, well, in order to have a lot of men's groups and get men in groups, you have to have guys who are willing to lead those groups. So, so Steve, uh, again, I, I just, I'm excited to hear what you're going to bring based on your experience and your time in ministry. And thank you again for being with us. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Dave. It was, it was great to be with you last week. And uh, I am sorry, I got a little worked up and I apologize, guys. I will try to just calm myself a little bit today. Um, but, uh, you know, today we're talking about this subject of, of, of leadership and, and, and specifically talking about, you know, leading small groups. And, and, and I think sometimes, you know, that in our society today, we can sort of, you know, guys are sort of pushed down and leadership is pushed down and, and, and leadership may not have a, a good connotation right now. And, and, and yet, you know, as I look through the scriptures, that all the way through scriptures, that, that, that God always used people to do his work, right? And, and I think what I, what I want to just encourage you guys in is, 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 is this, whether you realize it or not, you are a leader. Every one of us is a leader somewhere, all right? We're, we're a leader in the home. We're a leader at work. We're a leader maybe on a team, um, maybe in the, the neighborhood or on a, in, a, on a, in a club um, and in the, in the church, um, in government or at school. I mean, all of us are, are in leadership somewhere. And uh, leadership is not a bad thing. It's a, it's a God-given thing. And, uh, and, and, and the key is, is how do you lead, right? That's, that's the, 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 the key. And, and, and one of the things that encourages me most, and I was, as, 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 a, as a pastor of men's ministry, I was always looking for the, trying to raise up guys in, in, into leadership. And it's, 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 it's a journey. And, and, but one of the things that encourages me, and I hope it encourages you too, is that God always uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. When I look at scripture, God, God took dust and he created something as complex as, as mankind. When he wanted to speak to Moses, he, he didn't use a cellular phone or anything like that. He just he used a burning bush. And when David was going to take on Goliath, he just used a couple of stones. When Jesus was born, he was born in a, in a dark day, cave. And, and, and all the way through, guys, God uses the ordinary. And I think so often as men, we think we're not worthy. We don't think we're, we're good enough. Boy, if, if, if you knew the mistakes I've made, if you knew the things that I think. If you know the places I've been, you would, you would never even be talking to me about leadership or being used by God. But here's the point. God knows. God knew all the mistakes that, that David made and that Moses made, right? He, he knew the mistakes that, 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 that Paul had made. He, he knows the mistakes that all of us make. God's not surprised by these things. And yet the, the beauty of the scriptures is, is that God takes us where we're at. He takes us to where he wants us to be, all right? He doesn't say only perfect people allowed. He says, no, in your weakness, I am strong. That's the beauty of being a servant of the Lord Jesus, is that he takes us just as we are. And here's the point, guys, is that oftentimes what I've discovered in working with men is that he will use our greatest point of pain and failure for our greatest point of ministry and our greatest uh, impact for ministry. And so if we've struggled and if we've gone through a divorce in the past, oftentimes he'll use that to encourage other men that are going through divorce and you can walk with them through that. For the guy that's been an alcoholic and struggled with drugs or alcoholism, oftentimes he's going to use that in, in, in ministering to guys that are struggling in that area. 
before I became a men's ministry past, pastor, I, I had an addiction. And my addiction was to work. I was a workaholic. And I had to go through three years of counseling and therapy to deal with that. Not knowing that God was going to take a guy addicted to work and a workaholic, it was my drug of choice, and to help me to go through the rehab of that, then to begin working with guys who so many of them are struggling with work-family balance. And God used that journey in my own life for the ministry he had for me in the future. And here's the principle, guys, in leadership, is that so our, our, our future is anchored in our past. It's, a, it's the story of scripture. And, and so some of you guys right now are going, I could never lead a small group. I could never lead in the church. I can't lead in my family because of all that I've done. Listen, you're not the first one to have excuses. Just look at Exodus 3 and 4 and look at the story of, of, of Moses, right? And you're going to find five excuses. Well, I'm not, who am I to do this? And God says, what? I am who I am. It's not about you, buddy. It's about me. Well, what am I going to say? Don't worry. I'm going to put the words in your mouth. I, I don't have any power. Don't worry. You see that staff in your hand? That's all you need. And he, Moses just kept on throwing out the excuses. Guys, I don't care what the excuses you have. God's greater. I don't care what you've been through. God is greater. And God is going to use you. So who is the man that God uses? He uses the ordinary man. He uses the man that's sensitive to the needs around him. Guys, here's the point. Just look at that story in Nehemiah 1. I love it because Nehemiah's relatives come and they say, listen, Nehemiah, the, the walls in Jerusalem are broken down. or The people are defenseless. They're discouraged. And, and, and Nehemiah, Nehemiah began to weep. He was absolutely broken by what was going on in Jerusalem. And the point of the story is this, that oftentimes our brokenness is the fuel for discovering our purpose and where God wants to use us and where God wants to, to have us lead. And so the question I always ask is, what's breaking your heart? Because whatever's breaking your heart is most likely breaking the heart of God. And he's going to use you right there. And here, what's, what's breaking God's heart? What's breaking God's heart are thousands and thousands of men all over your area, your city, who are lost, who are wandering, who are drifting, who are struggling with addiction, who are, who are, who are, are, are just trying to figure out life. And they need some leaders to come alongside and to, to say, I want to be committed to men and I want to minister to men. And it, it may be involved in, in, in evangelism ministry. It may be in, in leading small groups and getting guys connected in, in small groups because God can use anyone. If you, if you have a heart that's broken, that's sensitive to the needs around you, God will use you. And the third quality I see in Nehemiah is that he was available. He was just available. He said, God, use me. Just use me. I don't have all the talents. I'm a cupbearer. All I can do is serve food. But God, if you can take those gifts and those talents and a willing heart, then you, then God do it. And what did Nehemiah do? He performed a miracle. He went back and they built the walls of Jerusalem because of a cupbearer. If God can use he, him, he can use each one of you guys as well. And Nehemiah was prayerful. God's not looking for great skills. He's looking for men who are broken, men who are available men who are ordinary, and men who are prayerful. And you see the prayer of Nehemiah in chapter 1. How are the, the high walls around men going to come down? The thick walls around men going to be softened? How are they going to come into a relationship through Christ? Is it by you and I having slicker strategies and being more eloquent and having leading, asking the best questions in our small group? No, it's going to happen through prayer. It's going to happen when you and I take the, the, the hearts of men and we place them into the hands of a holy God. And we say, God, only you can do this. Only you can open up this man's heart. Only you can draw him to yourself. That's what God's looking for, guys. He's looking for guys that are just ordinary like you and I. He's looking for guys that are just broken about the state of men today. He's looking for men that are available and say, God, here I am. Use me. He's looking for men that are pray prayerful. And will just go forward on their knees and say, God, only you can do that. And he's going to use men that have a, a vision for multiplication, for making disciples. 
guys, he's not calling you. And there's not a need just to, 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 to lead a social gathering. That's what not these small groups are about. This is about making disciples who make disciples who, 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 who make disciples. And so it's having that vision of saying, you know what? I understand that, that I'm going to die at some point. And when I die, I'm going to live on in two ways. I'm going to live on in eternity with Jesus. And I'm going to live on in the men, women, boys, and girls I influence for Jesus. So guys, it's time to get out of the pews. It's time to get out of the pews and to, to raise your hand and say, yeah, I want to I want to be a part of that movement. I want to I want to help launch a movement in South Florida of discipleship. And I want to see it start here. I want to see it start here. And we're going to start with a few groups. And I'm going to be a part of that. And we're going to see where God takes this thing. And you're going to, be, five years from now, 10 years from now, you're going to look back in the rearview mirror as a church. And what are you going to see? You're going to see hundreds and hundreds of guys connected in small group. You're going to see families changed. You're, seeing, you're going to see marriages changed. And you get to be a part of it. You get to put a dent in eternity. Let me just close with a story. I want to tell you about Dick. Dick came to me 20 years ago. Dick, Dick was not a believer. And his daughter went to university. She came to Christ. And, and, and she, she, she came back at Christmas. And, 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 and Dick said, honey, what do you want for Christmas? And she said, dad, I just, how about you come to Christmas Eve service? He goes, really? That's it? And she goes, yep, that's it. He goes, that's the cheapest gift ever. So he came to our Christmas Eve service. And then he came back the second week and the third. And then he called me up. He said, hey, are you a pastor at this church? I want to get together and talk. I said, sure, I'll get together. So he came into my office. He said, I've been hearing a lot about this born again stuff, about, about, about having a relationship with Jesus. What in the world does that mean? He didn't use that word, but he said, what in the world do you, what does this mean? And so I got a piece of paper out and I shared the gospel best as I could. And he said, really? God does this all? He sent his son Jesus? It's, it's just purely a gift? He said, this is the best deal in town. Why doesn't everyone know about this? I said, Dick, that's a great point. He says, what do I need to do? Where do I sign? I said, Dick, you don't have to sign anything. He says, what do I need to give? I said, Dick, you don't have to give anything. I said, Dick, I said, you need to know this. The entrance fee on this costs you nothing. But the maintenance fee, man, it's going to cost you everything. He commits his life to Jesus. He said, now what do I do? I said, Dick, now you get in a small group. We had, a, a, we had these Top Gun groups. They were a nine-month discipleship experience. Two hours of homework, two hours in class. And, and I said, Dick, you need to join a Top Gun group. He says, really? He says, does everyone do this? I said, oh, yeah, Dick, every man does this. He had no clue. He didn't have any idea. And so he joins this group. He goes through the nine-month experience. He calls me up. He says, Steve, now what do I do? I said, Dick, now you do the next nine months. He goes, really? Does everyone do this? I said, Dick, everyone does it. He goes, the, the second year. He comes back at the end. He says, Steve, now what do I do? I said, Dick, now you lead a group. He says, you got to be kidding. He says, I suppose you're going to tell me everyone does this. I said, Dick, exactly. I, he says, I said, Dick, find 12 guys, and you take them through that nine-month experience. And he does it. He didn't know any better. And he does it again and again. Five years later, he says, Steve, can I just, like, sell my companies and just do this all the time? I said, go for it, Dick. Five years later, Steve, I just got back from the dock. I got an inoperable tumor on my brain. What do I do now? I said, just keep on loving your wife, love your daughters, and keep investing in men. And I'd go out to his house, and we would take walks, and we'd pray together. Then I'd push him in his wheelchair. I sat by his bed. And with about a month to live, Dick said, Steve, you've done so much for me. Is there anything I can do for you? I said, Dick, yeah, could you come to this spring breakfast that we do, the Breakfast of Champions. It's evangelistic. It's at a hotel. I said, there's going to be about 600 guys there. Could you come? I just want to honor you. I want to thank you for what you've done. He comes. Family bundles him up. They bring him in a van. After breakfast, we bring him up onto the stage. And I said, Dick, I want to just thank you so much for, for all that you've done. I gave him a little plaque. And then I had one of those leadings of the Holy Spirit guys. And I wasn't sure. Was it the pizza the night before? Was it, was it the Spirit leading me? And uh, I said, guys, here's what we're going to do. If any of you came to Christ through Dick, or you were a disciple by Dick, I want you to stand right now. 600 guys in the room, 150 guys stood. And I'm like bawling like a baby. And I look at Dick and he's bawling. I said, Dick, in just a few weeks, you're going to die. And when you do, you're going to be in the presence of Jesus. And you're going to be there for eternity. 
but I want you to know you're going to live on in the men that you've influenced for Jesus. And guys, it's the same with each one of us. Every one of us is going to die at some point. And when we do, we're going to live on in two ways. We're going to live on in eternity with Jesus. And we're going to live on in the men we influence for Jesus. Who are you influencing for Jesus? Guys, it's time to get out of the pew and into the game. Because God has a great, great adventure for your life. That's why you should be a small group leader, guys. That's it. I'll stop there. Dave, thanks for having me. This has been great. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing that. Um, so as you know, we, we like to do our, our, our kind of land the plane on that tangible takeaway. Yeah. Uh, and I guess in a, in a sense, I'm going to, I'm going to steal your thunder. Uh, Cause I'm not going to ask you what the tangible takeaway is. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this question at any point in, in the, the years you spent with Dick as he was uh, learning and as he was leading and as he was growing, uh, was there ever a point where you would say that he felt worthy, that he felt like he was, um, you know, uh, enough that he, he felt like um, this is what he was born to do uh, or was he always just, you know, doing what he felt like he, he could do based on, you know, the, the person he was and the person he had been? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, it's, it's sort of a yes and a no. I think Dick always had the attitude of this is not about me. This is about God. And he really sensed that this is an incredible privilege and honor that God's allowed me to be to join him and to be a part of what God is doing in the world. And there was always that sense of humility, even though he was a business owner, very, very successful. Boy, I just saw this deep humility in his life of understanding it wasn't about him. It truly was about God. And I think part of that came from the fact of where he came from. And he came to Christ later in life. And uh, he was humbled by that. And he realized the mistakes he had made in life with his marriage and with his daughters. And, and that all got reconciled. Um, but there was a sense that as we coached them, and that's key to know that guys, we're not, you're not going to just start leading and be out there by yourself, but that in, in, you're going to be coached and you're going to get training. We never ask a man to do anything we're not willing to train him to do. And, and so we trained Dick. He was an apprentice leader. He, he learned from others. And then we coached him along the way. So he's never out there by themselves. And so he felt like, okay, they're, they're behind me. They're backing me. They're with me. But there was a time, I would say, you know, after a while where he said, boy, I, I want to train others. And he started now developing apprentices in his group. And he was, he was developing leaders nonstop. Um, and so, yeah, there, there was a change. There was always that attitude that, that he, of humility, but also a sense of, boy, um, God's used me. And I want, to, I want to help others to do this as well, because this is pretty cool. And, and, and I, I want to help others experience what I've experienced. That's great. So, guys, the, the challenge there is, I, I guess, to, to just accept the fact that you are a leader, that yeah. you are supposed to be a leader, um, and, and that leadership isn't going to look like Steve's, it isn't going to look like mine, it isn't going to look like Dick's. Um, God's got a unique plan for you. He's got a unique journey for you. Uh, but he wants to use all of those, those bruises, all of those busted up moments of your past all those moments where you felt like you weren't qualified uh, or worse that you were disqualified from ever being able to, to lead. Uh, yeah. He wants to use all of that. Um, yeah. uh, again, in your story of Dick is the perfect illustration of that. So Steve, thank you uh, again for your time, for your willingness to share uh, and, and just for a powerful testimony uh, that, you know, now Dick's, uh, legacy lives on through through even this program and and the the guys who will hear from it and, yeah. and that's a, a very cool testimony that uh you know we can all benefit from yep yeah. yeah. thank you all right gentlemen thank you again for tuning in and we will see you again next week on drive time